Hello, everybody, and welcome to Day 3 of Design Week 2022. I'll be your host today. My name is Clifford Swartz, and today's topic is all about security and functional safety, or FUSA. Now, I have an esteemed panel of experts here to talk to you about today's topics, but before we dive into that, I'm going to throw it over to Nate in the booth, and he's going to tell all of you wonderful people how to participate. How are you doing today, Nate? Hello, thank you very much. I am back. So uh, welcome to day three, the final of Design Week, where we talk about the latest and greatest at Microchip. We are broadcasting once again from YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So please like, comment, and subscribe. And please follow and send it to your friends and family, even if it's by uh, message in a bottle or carrier pigeon if you have to. <laughs> Anyways, if you have any questions, please leave it in chat. And if we don't get to your question, you can always email it to livestream at microchip.com. Thank you very much. Very cool. Thank you. So, like Nate was saying, and as you can see on my screen, Design Week is a three-day event, and today is the final day of it. But fret not, because uh, the content does not end when this live stream does. If you go to microchip.com forward slash Design Week, it'll take you to this landing page. And if you click Register Now, it'll take you to the On24 page, where you can see all the different content that we have from all previous days and today. So I highly encourage you guys to check it out. A lot of engineers have put on a lot of effort into this, and uh, now we can actually dive into the topic and we can talk and introduce some of those engineers. First and foremost, to my left, we have Xavier. How are you doing? Good, Clifford. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Always. It's a party. To his left, we have Jeanette. How are you, Jeanette? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Always. And through the power of the internet, we have two special guests. Uh, first, we have Mark. How are you? Good, Clifford. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. And then just above him, we have Todd. How are you, Todd? I'm good, Clifford. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. And so, Todd, I'm going to direct my first question over to you. What is the latest and greatest within security? Well, it's a, an open question, but I'll start with specifications because there's uh, no shortage of activity in uh, security specifications around the globe. Uh, so if you kind of take a pop-up of the map here, you can see lots of activity for IoT, uh, sort of focused specifications from Europe, basically everywhere around the globe, Australia, Korea, uh, North America. And then we also have activity in the data center space with the Open Compute Project, uh, lots of activities surrounding that. Uh, in the automotive world, we have uh, ISO 21434 uh, that has recently come out. So uh, this is only a small spattering, actually, of all of these specifications that are out there. You could spend your days and evenings on endless uh, number of calls uh, trying to help develop these specs or best practices. Uh, so it, it can be daunting uh, as someone's trying to design a, a node, a system of some kind that has to comply to a variety of these specifications. Uh, the good news is, is that we see many, many common themes as it relates to security uh, and network devices. So, you know, if you think about the building blocks, we traditionally see secure boot as a first requirement for a system to be upgraded. And the motivations behind secure boot are that you can verify that the application code running in your host device is in a trusted state. Uh, so that should happen at the first time that you provision it, uh, but it should also tie into uh, field upgrade. So firmware updates in the field uh, should be signed, typically encrypted as well, and it should only be upgraded in your host device after cryptographically verifying the signature. Uh, then after you've proven that you're in more of a trusted state, uh, we see uh, lots of focus then on message authentication. So if you have multiple nodes in a network that are supposed to be sending and responding to messages, those messages should only be responded to by other nodes that are trusted and intended for your ecosystem. So you can use things like AES-based uh, CMAC or HMAC uh, for those sorts of message authentications. Then we move into uh, hardware a little bit. And in many cases, there's a desire to cryptographically verify the source of that module manufacturer. So if you think uh, some industrial network where uh, a pump goes out and you have to replace the pump, uh, it would be good to know that this was a pump that was accepted into the ecosystem, maybe approved by a specific OEM, and will will be a do no harm sort of device. So that ties into uh, X509 certificates uh, as a means to verify that. So you can query the new device uh, for its X509 certificate, verify the signature. Uh, you'll see that as step one, that this appears to be a device uh, intended for the ecosystem. And step two is to challenge it with a random number or nonce, uh, where that device has to use its secret key uh, that it's in charge of uh, uh, protecting 
to sign that data and prove knowledge of a secret without actually sending the secret across the bus. So that's kind of the, the use cases. And then we also see process requirements coming from a lot of these standards. Uh, so you look at a whole design life cycle where you have you know design concept through design uh, that needs to be a secure process, for example, only accessing um, cryptographic sorts of databases on site in a secure location rather than remotely, as an example. Uh, and then you go through production. There are uh, graceful end of life requirements, decommissioning. Uh, and then ultimately, in many cases, we see a requirement even after a project is done to have some number of years of maintenance support so that you still uh, respond to anything that you're getting queries for in the field. So um, along that process side of things, we see a requirement for vulnerability reporting capabilities. Uh, and so within Microchip, uh, PCERT, I believe we have a, a graphic here. Uh, this is our product security incident response team. This is a portal on Microchip that uh, anybody can access. And we have a, a dedicated core team that can review any submissions for vulnerability submissions that customers or any outside people may have inside for that matter uh, they review the submission and then determine if in fact it is a vulnerability and then beyond that they determine what level of vulnerability it might be and we will pull in then perhaps uh, an expanded team uh, for a specific business unit that might be impacted or responsible for a product uh, to evaluate it and then respond uh, either publicly or in some cases in addition uh, direct conversations with our customers who might be impacted by it and talk about some of the workarounds so that's kind of on the on the process side and then we move to uh, vulnerability assessments so most of these specifications either imply strongly encourage or mandate uh, that you have a third party assessment performed and in this case when we're talking about uh, security devices in silicon uh, it's really determining how well you protect your keys. So this Jill uh, scoring rating is the joint interpretation library scoring uh, system that is used by accredited labs all around the globe so that you get the same uh, basis for your score. And so you get different points based on uh, ultimately, were they able to extract a key? Uh, was it uh, a recent college grad or one of only a handful of people in the world that could perform the attack? Uh, how expensive was the equipment, uh, $250 DPA board or $500,000 laser injection machine. Um, and ultimately uh, you can score from zero to above 31. And if they are able to extract keys in a day, you would end up with zero. And then it increases from there. You can end up with Jill basic as you move to over a week. Uh, and ultimately Jill moderate is somewhere between one month and three months, but they were able to extract a key. And then Jill High means that after three person months of attempting to extract a key, they were unable to. So they consider it impractical and you would get a score of Jill High. Uh, we have some product lines within Microchip, uh, for example, crypto authentication and crypto automotive that have achieved uh, Jill High. And then outside of Jill High, um, we, which satisfies more of the common criteria world, um, maybe more of a focus in Europe uh, and Japan. Out of North America, we have FIPS. Uh, which is run by NIST, and they have uh, requirements and certifications for the algorithms through the cryptographic algorithm validation program. Uh, so you get a series of input vectors, and you provide your outputs, millions of them, to determine that the, the algorithms have been implemented properly. And then uh, surrounding that is a CMVP, cryptographic module validation program, which takes into account not only the algorithms, but now your whole processes, uh, like I discussed earlier in terms of how you run your design cycle. So lots of, uh, lots of things going on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. My next question is directed over to Jeanette. Jeanette, what sort of applications or broader market segments do we see using these Jill ratings? Yeah, so it's not just the Jill ratings like Todd just mentioned. It could be Jill, it could be FIPS, but you take a look at what we show in here and it really goes into a variety of different market segments. So you've got everything from telecommunications, networking, IoT, data centers, a lot of uh, new activity in vehicles, electric vehicles, ADAS, for example, machine learning. And really what you'll see across all of these is even though you've got different security needs based upon your risk assessments, um, if you take a look at what the requirements are, 
they're going to be very similar in what they define. So they'll talk about a secure boot for firmware authentication and the immutable code. They're going to talk about uh, firmware updates. And what's really interesting is even though all of these are similar requirements, when you actually start to take a look at these by some of those market segments that we just showed, um, you'll see that there's many different types of standards that are available. So if you look at this next slide, um, what you can see here is if you're looking for different vari um, variations of standards or certifications, here's an example of secure boot or flat platform firmware resiliency. Even though we're looking at different segments uh, that will need secure boot, they're going to have different specifications and certifications that they're looking at. So for example, multifunction printers are using the um, common criteria that's uh, still in development, that's in a draft form right now. Telecom is using different versions, one of them is an open one. Um, Todd talked a little bit about NIST standards, we're seeing that in uh, ADAS and computing and data centers, and that's really about how do you protect, detect, and recover. So even though you may have similar terms across your industries, it's really important to understand what that risk is and what that area of expertise is that you need to go define. Cool, thank you very much. And so I'd like to do a little bit of a deeper dive in some of the market segments that were mentioned. Todd, I'm gonna direct it over to you first. Do you mind breaking down automotive? Automotive, subject near and dear to me. Uh, yeah, so automotive has been disrupted here recently. Uh, just last quarter, uh, ISO was kind enough to release uh, cybersecurity for road vehicles, ISO 21434. Um, so this is kind of following in the footsteps of functional safety, which we'll talk about in more detail uh, a little bit later. Uh, but this is a, a process-driven standard. So this is not a device-level certification. Uh, so you could choose to have either a whole company or a business unit organization um, prove security worthiness through this uh, cybersecurity audit based on ISO 21434. And so this really does take you through that whole process of some of these best practice requirements for uh, design process from cradle to grave. Uh, again, talked about some of the maintenance things earlier, some of those requirements to continue to support. Um, this is ultimately the responsibility of the OEM to prove at a vehicle level uh, that it is compliant to ISO 21434. Uh, that being said, everybody in the ecosystem has a role to play, and so they will force things down on tier ones, and then there will be expectations for uh, tier twos, silicon providers like Microchip, uh, where we have to prove compliance to these 45 different work products identified in ISO 21434. Uh, and so during that process, there may be some uh, overlapping requirements or similar requirements in terms of an OEM has to perform a risk assessment, so does a tier one, so does a tier two. The OEM may look at the risk assessment more at a holistic vehicle approach, uh, determining that if a hacker were to get in, say, one particular node, what other nodes they could get access to within the vehicle and what harm could happen from that. Uh, the tier ones are a little bit more focused on the ECU. And then we, as a silicon provider, are focused on how well we can protect keys uh, in silicon. So we use kind of a basis for some of our risk assessments there as the application of attack potential to smart cards. I think they're on version 3.1 now. Uh, it's a document that uh, defines all of the known attacks against uh, secure elements or secure devices, and then talks about how you should mitigate against them. So uh, we, we go through that, that whole process as part of the risk assessment. Um, now, kind of the follow-up is which nodes in the vehicle are specifically impacted. And you know, a good rule of thumb is since functional safety has been around for a little while, ISO 26262, uh, there have been some priority nodes that have been identified, um, safety related. You, know, you can think about, uh, you know, rear facing cameras or uh, sensors, uh, anything that's going to, you know, make movement in the vehicle typically is going to require um, a functional safety rating. And so that is a totally separate specification, but typically those nodes that require it will also require the security upgrade with ISO 21434. So we kind of uh, find ourselves in the same area. We see EV getting a lot of attention uh, in charging. There are some standards coming out for mutual authentication between the vehicle and the charger. Uh, there are some you know, personal information that should be protected. There's financial information uh, that needs to go back and forth in a secure manner uh, to be able to pay for the charge. Uh, so that's uh, got a lot going on in the EV battery space. We see battery modules requiring that X509-based hardware authentication uh, to know that it's a safe battery. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's just easy to say that virtually every connected node that has a security requirement, which is uh, growing significantly every day, uh, will require uh, proof of support for and compliance for ISO 21434. Cool. Thank you very much. The next one that I want to take a look at is industrial, and for that, we're going to throw it over to Xavier. Yeah, thanks. So in, in the industrial world, they have actually taken, I would argue they take it probably a step further. So they do look at uh, procedure, processes, and if you look at my screen, we actually wrote uh, several documents at Microchip. Here's the example of a blog if you want to project my screen. Uh, that's a representation of the specification that has been put in place. It's called the IC62443. It was put in place by the, a lot of industrial companies, and several of them have, have pushed out press releases. Yeah, I'll call out ABB, Schneider, Siemens, Honeywell, uh, Rockwell, Johnson Control. All the guys work together to create this specification together. As you can see, it's composed of four different chapters. And the first one is about all all about definition. They define the terminologies, the terms of abbreviation, the metrics, and the use cases. And you're going to hear, hear us uh, talking a lot about use cases. So once the definitions are in place, then you have the processes and the policies. That's your second chapter. The third one starts to be closer and closer to the embedded system. So the system is the third chapter. And that's when they start to touch about the network of a connected factory what connects to a network, the things, right? The, the actual embedded systems, the pumps and, and all those devices of that sort. Inside the pumps, you have the semiconductor. And that's what that fourth chapter here, the component level, um, uh, how the, that fourth chapter connect to us, the semiconductor provider, and actually tells us how we should specify our devices that would go into the pump, that would go into the network and so forth. So they have actually, uh, like I said, they push that step further, the policies, they actually get into the network and the things connecting to the network. So what we've done here, we have a, you're looking at a blog that we have published, you can Google microchip IC6243 and you'll, you'll find it very easily. Um, so the, uh, the effort, we, why we put an effort there, the spec is about 900 pages because it, it really goes through a lot of details on all those four chapters. Um, we inside that spec, what we've done, we try to help to position our silicon and the features, the crypto features and functions of our silicon to reach a certain security level. And that's the other big dimension that's in that spec here is the five different security level that we see on my screen. That goes from, uh, they, they kind of follow the, the GIL philosophy, if you will, that started what I was describing a few minutes ago, where you go from zero where you have, it, it's, it's, it's minimum means a minimum knowledge that you have to actually perform an attack all the way up to having extremely uh, complex equipment, ton of budget, ton of knowledge to attack something. And that's kind of the, the philosophy of the rating. So they're using similar philosophy to rate a given security level uh, for a given piece of the system inside the network. Um, well, so on 6443, yeah, one thing very important, I'll, I want to give some kudos to one of our partners that actually help us to develop that material security pattern. So big thank you to, uh, to that company for help us uh, developing that content. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so now is probably a good point to mention that there are going to be links for everything that we have discussed and everything that we are going to discuss in the description and in the comments. And if you cannot find them, you can just email us at livestream at microchip.com and I will make sure that you guys get what you need. But thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, moving back to Todd, do you mind breaking down uh, wireless charging? Yes, wireless charging, uh, another industry with uh, all sorts of activity here recently. So uh, the Wireless Power Consortium, or the WPC, is the consortium responsible for trying to come up with harmonized uh, wireless charging specifications so that you don't ever have to carry a charger with you again, so that you can uh, imagine having a charger on your nightstand uh, overnight, and you head off into your car in the morning, and you can plop your... Uh, cell phone on a integrated charging pad within your vehicle console. Uh, you can go to a coffee shop, uh, maybe place it on a charger that's embedded on a coffee table. Uh, you get the picture. So version 1.2 Qi uh, specification, we're focused on 15 watt charge here uh, mostly today, while there's other activity taking place for some higher watt and even lower watt uh, applications. Uh, what has most action right now is this 15 watt segment, which is basically cell phones, tablets. So in Qi 1.2, uh, 
Uh, you could place your cell phone on a charger and they did come up with an extended power profile moving from five watts to 15 watts, but they didn't have any authentication. And so in, in those days, you can place your phone on perhaps a poorly designed charger that is uh, claiming to be WPC approved, but it was not. Uh, you could actually cause some damage to your cell phone and cell phones are quite commonly over a thousand dollars these days. So uh, nobody wants to see that happen. So with the release of Qi 1.3, uh, last year, we saw the addition of authentication, and this is hardware-based authentication. So now, when you place your phone on the charger, uh, initially it may accept a zero-watt charge or maybe just a five-watt charge, and then it would go through an authentication protocol with the charger. So that charger is required by the WPC to have a, an approved secure element, so things like elements that have gotten a Jill High rating, um, and then that device is responsible for parsing the X509 certificate and then protecting the key to prove knowledge of that secret, like I talked about before. So after you go through the authentication protocol successfully and prove that this is uh, a do no harm quality charger, now your cell phone would accept a 15 watt charge and stay well ahead of the game, even if you're, you're launching apps like Maps and, uh, and music at the same time. So. Uh, all sorts of activity there on the silicon side. And then the other point is that you must provision those devices. And so you need to be an approved licensed WPC manufacturing certificate authority, which microchip is. Uh, so we have a full solution there on WPC with our secure elements, our microcontrollers that handle the Qi stack, the DSPIC 33, and, uh, and all of the software that goes with it. So check out our reference designs and uh, we've got you covered for WPC security. I dig it. Thank you very much. Jeanette, you're up next. Do you mind diving into data centers? Sure. And one of the things that you talked about is what's really changed. A few years ago, a lot of our customers were really just learning what security is, and now we've seen more and more standards come out. We've also seen in the U.S. and in Europe um, a lot of standards that have been reserved for national security for, um, for classified types of devices has now moved into um, the unclassified types of arenas. And so you can see listed on this, this screen that we have right here, there's actually several different bodies that are used for uh, data center types of security. Uh, obviously NIST is one of them. That's where we're gonna define a lot of the algorithms. They also have a standard called the 800-193. That is how do you protect, detect, and recover. So how do you make sure that there's no malware during the pre-boot environment? Make sure that if there is some kind of a glitch that you're able to catch it, so that's the detect. And more importantly, that you can recover to a known good state. There's also things like the open compute project that you see there. They're in the process of developing, well not in the process, they developed a security checklist. Um, they are in the process of actually moving away from that checklist, but they have these guidelines of what the minimum security capabilities needs to be for data centers. And so I encourage you to go check out all of those standards and to take a look at it. It is very complicated. Um, so there are a lot of things that we will offer from a microchip perspective to help you along that journey, along that path in terms of expertise in certifications, design reviews, et cetera. And we do have a whole comprehensive solution for whatever components you may have in the servers, the backplanes, the storage, even the power chargers that go into data centers that may be able to help you. Cool, thank you very much. Xavier, you are up next, IoT. Okay, so in IoT, the, um, as you, we go back to the map of standards right there, there is, something else that happened that was actually uh, quite revolutionary, I would call that quite revolutionizing uh, it for the industry, uh, it's legislation. So if uh, in the US, I'll start with the US, switch quickly to Europe and then the rest of the world. Uh, in the US, a couple of years ago, we had, um, it was the uh, California and Oregon that was some of the first state to have an intent to legislate uh, IoT security, I'll put it this way. Well, the White House recently um, started to have the, to push for the Cyber Act. So what it means, they has assigned the NIST organization to look into creating a security label for connected products. Well, what happened before that actually came from the UK. The UK, I think, was the first government um, that uh, wanted to legislate IoT security in some fashion. So. What happened, if we show uh, Clifford, if you want to show your next slide here, Absolutely. what happens, the IoT Security Foundation, there's a ton of, uh, quite a few um, expert company that joined the IoT Security Foundation, it was born in the, in the UK, I believe, 
uh, and they start to put uh, security practices together. And that's what we're looking at on the screen. So there are 13 pillars that they've defined. If you look at the first three ones, no default passwords, have a disclosure process that Todd was mentioning, that's the other word for P-search really, uh, update your software. So why are those first three highlighted? This, those are the first three the UK government wants to uh, legislate, intend to legislate. They have been, it's been intention since 2020, COVID hit and of course delays and, and things like that happen. So there's still intention to push that forward in 2022. When it will happen, we don't know really. Uh, but that was an example for, I would argue the rest of the world because uh, we've seen immediately after the EU embracing all 13 pillars. And they are trying, the EU is trying to, from what we hear, they are trying to uh, legislate all 13 pillars at, at the same time. So now you look at the fourth one, secure your credentials. Fifth one, communicate security and so forth. So those are uh, foundational practices that are really nothing new. If you look at all the microchip collateral for the past, I would argue, six years, we've been preaching all those things for, for that long. The big new things that happen, like Todd said, the standards, uh, you, uh, enforcing foundations, and now we're talking about legislation. So you got to be ready, and that's kind of the message we are, we're giving to our customers as legislation are hitting us. So what it means in, the, in Europe for, for sure, you, our customer to sell an IoT product in the consumer market will have to comply to whatever has been legislated whenever it's, it's legislated, of course. So we have the technology in place to help our customers uh, doing that. So legislation is, is the big, big new thing in IoT. Cool, thank you very much. And so that brings us to the end of the market segments portion of it. And there are more market segments that we could talk about, but we're going to move on to embedded solutions and the impact security has had on that. And I'm going to throw it back over to Xavier. Yeah, so I'll piggyback on the, on, on the, the last, um, last few points I was making on legislation. So there you go. Now we have legislation that are often inspired by a standard. And the standard tells us use case functions and, and features and policies to follow. So the impact is, um, going back to what I was saying on processes, we expect more and more control processes in developing silicon, in developing turnkey product like the, the, the pump that would go into an oil rig. So enforcement of processes during product development is going to be, I think, more and more uh, audited. Let's put it this way, not to say legislate. Audited would be probably a better word. So that's one. On the device level, the way it's going to impact us is we have to look at functions and fixtures. Well, I'll talk about, uh, I, meant, I refer to a function as um, ECP256, uh, AES256, and also those are, are features, crypto features in my mind. The function would be how do you enable secure boot at the silicon level, right? And now with talk silicon, you have port, different portfolios of silicon. Right? You have microprocessors, a PGA, controllers, secure element, connectivity uh, technologies, and all of them have their function blocks for security. So when you use that and you put them together, what do you achieve? And that leads me to something else that, um, in my opinion, it's poorly done in, 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 the, in the light embedded. On the heavy embedded, what I call embedded would be all the, the above one gigahertz type of processors. Yeah, it's all the NVIDIA, Intel of the world, Qualcomm, and you name it. They've used those security practices for a very long time, right? It's, um, how am I going to call that? Um, I've called that containers, security containers, to, for, for lack of better words, trying to generalize the terms, right? So you'd have a container for your keys, you have a containers for your critical code, and you have a container for uh, your application code that's not that critical. Well, you can subdivide those containers, and how you go from one to the other, it's permis rights and permissions. How do you allow a user or different user with different user access privilege, now it's starting to toss security notion, to go into the, the secure uh, container that contains the code, the secure containers that has the key. Well, you don't want to go there, but you want it to challenge and respond to this one, right? And that's what the standards are going to push our customers, and the customers are going to push us to offer technology to answer that bigger picture. Uh, doesn't seem easy, but it's not that complicated, because we do have the pieces to, uh, to achieve that. Very cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, Todd, I'm going to throw it over to you again. Do you mind breaking down some of the use cases that we would see for things like Xavier and all of you guys have been mentioning, like Secure Boot and uh, maybe even a real world example? Yeah, I guess I'll talk about the motivations to implement Secure Boot first. You know, in 
Uh, general networking world, uh, several years ago, we had the Heartbleed bug, which was able to exploit a pretty simple buffer overflow attack in any device that was networked using OpenSSL. And basically what the result was is that you were able to gain access to separate portions of memory that you shouldn't be able to remotely and actually extract keys. And so uh, there are millions and millions, if not billions of devices out there uh, that rely on OpenSSL. So that was a problem. It has been uh, remediated. But in the in the automotive world, a prominent uh, SUV ended up in a ditch is what got a lot of attention. Uh, but initially in 2010, uh, these hackers performed uh, a video of a hack of a vehicle, but they were wired and actually sitting in the backseat of the vehicle. And so OEM said, that's not a problem. That's not a real you know threat. And now in 2016, they figured out uh, there was a bug in the Sprint network that was coming along with this particular uh, brand of vehicle. And they were able to exploit that remotely, uh, totally far away from the vehicle as someone was driving down the highway. And initially they did things like benign um, things like uh, turn on the air conditioning at full blast and the guy couldn't turn uh, the knob down. And they were able to crank the stereo with some uh, obnoxious music, you might say and he was unable to turn uh, the volume down. And ultimately they took it to the step where they disengaged the engine, shut down the engine, and the guy just had a vehicle that wouldn't respond to any accelerator action uh, and ended up just dying on the highway there. Uh, he did not physically die, the car did. Uh, and then they brought it to uh, a parking lot and continued to perform some uh, maneuvers where they were able to take over steering and end up pushing the car into a ditch. So. Uh, that ended up with uh, an actual recall of vehicles of 1.4 million vehicles. So that was a game changer uh, in the industry. In parallel, near similar time, there was a prominent EV vehicle uh, that was hacked by a group of Chinese students that were able to also take control remotely, uh, opening and closing the sunroof um, and, and having similar sorts of things happen uh, like they did in the SUV. Now taking control of the windshield wipers and perhaps disengaging the windshield wipers, moving the seats up back and forth. So these sorts of stories ended up with new regulation, new specifications, and virtually every OEM in the world scrambling to come up with new cybersecurity specifications so that they can prevent those sorts of hacks. So one of the, the things that you're starting to see now to prevent unauthorized commands in, in a vehicle is what I mentioned earlier. Now you have, say, on the CAN network with CANFD, with more uh, payload available for security, you can tack on a message authentication code. And so uh, we ourselves, Microchip, had hacked an instrument cluster and demonstrated how we can get it to misbehave, uh, send all the alarms off if you have unauthenticated messages, but then if you turn on message authentication, that instrument cluster can simply filter out all of the spoofed messages and only respond to the good ones. So uh, lots of examples leading to lots of specification activities. Cool. And so I think one of the big takeaways is that security at the moment currently is not an afterthought. It's something that you have to be designing with uh, from the get go. And so absolutely, that's where we are currently. Jeanette, do you mind talking a little bit about where we see security going in the future? Well, absolutely. If you think about what's happening in the industry, a lot of our designs, a lot of the, what our customers are designing, they're not going to get into market for 18 to 24 months. So what security standards are going to be in place in 18 to 24 months? Xavier spent a lot of time talking about um, the regulations that are happening across the world from very you know, various countries. So how do you make sure that the design that you're doing in the future is going to be able to handle some of those capabilities that are coming? Um, if you take a look at the slide that we're showing right here, here's some of the things that are not mandated yet, but we're seeing trends toward these. So we're working to add this capability into our solutions that will help you put them into your solutions as you go forward. One of those, for example, and there's several that are listed there, but one of those, for example, is transfer of ownership. And so Xavier was also talking about how do you authenticate users and what is the level of priorities, but what happens after that equipment has served its useful purpose in the industry? So maybe I'm in a high um, state where maybe I've got a piece of equipment that I turn every two years. Well, that equipment is still good, so now I want to turn it and give it to a value-added reseller, third-party seller. Maybe it's going to go from there to education. It's going to go to some other market. Another owner may take that. 
how do I make sure that I keep my secrets secret and that they're not passed on when I now sell that equipment or transfer that equipment? And that's where things like transfer of ownership is, really comes to play. And as Xavier showed us on those 13 pillars earlier, that was incorporated into there. How do I keep my confidential um, information confidential? How do I make sure that I'm able to re uh, delete this information? So starting to prepare for those and look to those futures and start to bake them in now is going to set us up for the future um, as all of these new trends are coming to at us. Cool. And so, Xavier, I'm going to throw it over to you to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, device uh, revocation and uh, response time, I believe. Right, right. There's the, so, the, the first is um, device management. Janet, he did a little bit on it. It's, it's something we see, it's, um, it's a practice that came from the IT industry, really, and uh, that has been pushed into those standards that we've looked just a few minutes, pretty much all of them. Actually, Todd mentioned the EV charging, it's 51118. You've got the OCPP also in EV charging, you've got 6443, IoT, all of them are, are looking at this, this use case. So what it is, it's you, how do you onboard a device into a network? <coughs> how do you um, revocate the certificate? And that's kind of some of the standard I would argue stop and they don't honestly help to find a solution of what needs to happen. You need to renew your certificate uh, and you need to set policies on when, when you revocate, when you uh, renew it and why. And the, the last one is um, make sure start um, uh, building revocation list, right? To uh, prohibit those devices to, uh, to connect when they are, they are declared rogue devices. So there is actually a whole session today that's available to you in the design week. Uh, I'm going to take the occasion to promote the Shields app Absolutely. season three here. That's on my screen. Thank you for showing it. We are working on a season three. We will talk about we're changing the concept a little bit here where we are talking and we start to talk about attacks that are publicly known and how they could have been solved or mitigated uh, by uh, microchip technology. So we're inviting partners that are going to join the series. So for follow us there, you can subscribe to the, to the mailing list and you'll get the update when we, uh, we launch the, the session. So that was your question on um, uh, device management. I, want to, I think it's time to transition to the safety topic. And I think the way we wanted to transition was to, uh, I need to piggyback to the uh, 64.3 example and some of the example uh, Todd was giving in the world of automotive. We all started to talk about security and start to mix a little bit of safety, right? And that's where in the industrial and automotive world, um, that's what's happening. So I'll give you the example, the credit card example, the family credit. <laughs> so another kudo to a security pattern they actually gave us this example. I, I'll give them kudo there. So what's happening, imagine um, historically the security standards come from the server and the payment market. So if you're in front of the cashier, you got a credit card and you push your card once, it doesn't work. Twice, it doesn't work. Three times, it doesn't work. So what happens after the third time, the cashier will ask you, hey, swipe the magnetic, magnetic band and it works. So what happened there, you had a time lapse between each attempt to, effect, to, uh, to perform the payment. And that's acceptable for the payment industry. That is absolutely not acceptable when you have an individual in the car, when you have an operator in front of an equipment that, that's about to face an accident. Those systems have to have a different reaction mode immediately, immediately. And that's that notion of reaction time that starts to kick in, that, that's trying to be taken into account into 6443. And that's where I think Mark is, is going to explain us how the wall of safety is trying to address that by leveraging uh, security practices that Todd and, and Janet and I talked about. Absolutely, Mark, take it away. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right, Xavier. So um, functional safety actually dictates that hazards have a finite uh, fault tolerant time or the time that, that we have to detect a problem and get to a safe state. Um, if we look in the textbooks, it says that uh, functional safety is freedom from unacceptable risk due to hazards caused by malfunctioning behavior of electrical or electronic systems. And so, you know, that's our scope, of course, uh, is electrical electronic systems. And, and we say that um, we're, we're trying to uh, get to acceptable risk. So, you know, while we prioritize safety over, you know, costs and schedules, uh, we have to do what's practical. So we, we just need to get to that acceptable risk. Cool. And so my first question for you is what causes those sorts of uh, hazards in electrical systems? All right. So there are, you know, there are two primary causes. Uh, the, the first is systemic or design concerns, um, like software bugs or circuit errors. 
the second is uh, random hardware failures. Uh, you know, a failed component or failed something fails inside of your MCU, something, something along those lines. Absolutely. And so next up is what can we do to reduce the risk of injury to uh, the system and to the people around it? Yeah, so, you know, we can minimize the systemic or the design concerns, the software bugs, things like that, by using uh, robust design processes that really ensure that we don't make mistakes. So, um, you know, those, those sorts of processes uh, have somebody looking over our shoulder and, and making sure that everything we're putting in place is solid. Um, you know, on the the other concern are these random hardware uh, failures. So we need to detect those random faults in safety-related hardware and get to that safe state before anybody can get hurt. Absolutely. And so there's only so much that we can actually do to make a product safe. Uh, when do we know when we've done enough? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, I think just like any other engineering problem, uh, we need to step back and, and actually do the math. So we can ensure that, you know, the residual risk or the, the risk that's left after we mitigate what we practically can is lower than the tolerable, tolerable risk or the, the risk that um, society deems acceptable. So, you know, we have to take those things into consideration and, uh, you know, look at it from a practical standpoint. Um, to do that, we, we can use what we call an FMEDA or a failure mode effects diagnostic analysis. And we can quantify the, the failure rates of our components and calculate some metrics. And those metrics tell us if the system is really safe enough. Cool, thank you very much. And so we spent a lot of time earlier talking about standards and uh, regulations when it came to security. Do you mind walking us through some of the standards when it relates to FUSA or functional safety? So I think we're a little bit more mature than, than the uh, security market. Um, and I think uh, the, those guys may be copying us a little bit, um, but at the heart of the functional safety standards, we have IEC 61508, which is an industrial functional safety standard. Again, with the scope of electrical electronic programmable systems. And that's kind of, uh, I, I call it the mother standard because most of the other standards actually uh, either refer back to that one or it's, it, it use, they use that one as a, um, as a base. Uh, so some of the other ones that are on here, you know, we have uh, in the center the industrial, but we have also have automotive ISO 26262. And if you compare ISO 26262 to uh, ISO 21434 for security, uh, you can see there's a very parallel sort of uh, flow to those. Um, they both talk about life cycles and uh, it, it's, it's pretty interesting to, to see how closely related th those things really are. Um, other, other markets have their uh, market-specific standards. Uh, we have uh, nuclear and railway, and that's where we start to run into some of the really high SIL levels, or safety integrity levels, that uh, make us use more and more rigor as we do our design. Cool, thank you very much. Do you mind walking us through the design flow of somebody who is interested in using functional safety? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Functional safety dictates that we start considering safety right at the very beginning of any sort of a design. So we have to write an item definition. We have to take safety into consideration. Uh, so at item definition, we obviously define what the product is, what it's going to do. And then we move down from there. Um, and the first thing we're going to do, again, very similar to security, where they actually do some sort of a threat analysis, we do a hazard analysis and risk assessment. So H. ARA hazard analysis risk assessment. And depending on how severe that hazard is and how probable it is, um, we can assign some sort of a uh, safety integrity level. And that safety integrity level moves down through the uh, life cycle so that safety goals that we generate to support that or prevent the hazards from occurring uh, inherit that safety integrity level. And then below safety goals, we get down to what we call functional safety requirements. And that's really the requirements that the system has to implement to ensure that uh, nobody gets hurt or we don't harm the environment either. Um, those things are typically, I'm gonna say, driven by an OEM. And uh, all those things together, we consider to be the, the functional safety concept. Um, below that, if we keep going down, 
we get to what we call technical safety requirements. Now, technical safety requirements, again, they, they inherit that safety integrity level, um, but now we start to talk about implementation. How, how am I going to um, create or, or uh, in, satisfy the, the functional safety requirements? So that's, that's where we start to get down to um, architecture. And then when we go below that, we get into the actual hardware safety requirements and the software safety requirements, and we have some kind of a document that talks about the interface between those two things. Um, now, this whole lower section, you know, the from technical safety requirements on down, is typically driven by a supplier. So, an OEM, either it's a car OEM, or it could be a, 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 an OEM of a factory. Uh, you know, they would typically generate those top requirements and then they would hand that off to a supplier who's going to build a component or build a smaller subsystem and uh, that's typically how we see that life cycle flowing down. Cool, thank you very much. And my next question is at what point do we start to consider security? So that's a, a really interesting question and I, and I think that um, we, we consider security separately from safety so, you know, they have their standards, we have our standards. We've already said, uh, both Todd said and I said, and I think Xavier said that, that the standards are pretty darn similar, um, but we consider those things separately. And that may be, um, the, I think the standards do a great job of ensuring that, that we achieve safety and we ensure and, and achieve security, but um, it may be short-sighted to look at those things completely separately. So I think we need to, maybe have something else, another way to uh, analyze the system. I dig it. And so do you mind walking us through the next step in the design process? Right. So the, the design process, you know, that the section I showed before really are the first two blocks. This is actually a software V uh, process model where uh, the first two blocks on the left are what we reviewed uh, earlier and we're considering, um, you know, requirements and uh, architecture and then as we move down we get into you know unit um, uh, software unit generation and then you know we're actually doing the software design and then up the right side of the V um, we're doing verification and validation and and software test so you know just to kind of complete out the life cycle and I, Todd even mentioned that the life cycle goes further right it goes all the way down into production into maintenance into um, uh, commission as well. But uh, just to kind of complete the picture, I, I wanted to make sure you guys had an idea of what the process looked like. Cool. And so going back to the earlier topic of the uh, relationship between security and functional safety, do you mind diving a little bit deeper into that? Right. So I, I think it's more and more common for us to say safety and security. And Todd pointed out a few instances, um, and, and uh, Xavier pointed out a few instances uh, where you have to consider both. Um, and, and typically, if, if clients are coming into us saying, I need functional safety, especially when it's automotive, um, they're also saying, I need security. And, and I think um, it's, it's pretty common to say that you really can't have safety if you don't have security. Um, if somebody breaks into my Jeep and they hack the system, or my SUV, I should say, um, they... Uh, you can no longer consider that vehicle or that system to be safe. So, you know, when we when we look at the security system separately from the safety aspects of the system, um, you know, what what if what if there, there's a firewall and it thinks it's under attack? Maybe it's a denial of service attack and it starts blocking data from a sensor, and the safety system is relying on that data. Or what if um, the security policy, again, the system thinks it's under attack. Uh, there's some sort of a, a, a attack surface and, and it's under attack and it just says, oh, uh, my policy says to reset uh, that piece of hardware. When that piece of hardware is responsible for something in the, in the security, I'm sorry, in the, in the safety system, all of a sudden that's not available, um, you know, we could get into some serious trouble. Um, Actually, uh, there's an interesting story that I like to share. It's about the uh, Mars Polar Lander. This is back in uh, 1999, where uh, NASA sent uh, 
a lander up to Mars and made it all the way to the just above the surface. And as it deployed its landing gear, the landing gear sent a signal out that forced the, the system to turn off the, uh, the descent rockets. And it was still, unfortunately, about 100 feet above the, the Martian surface, and uh, it plummeted down and crashed. And when we did an analysis on that, what we found was that that, that signal from the landing gear was supposed to occur when the lander hit the, the surface of Mars. But as the landing gear deployed, um, it actually sent that signal out, and the descent rockets weren't supposed to be listening to that signal. There, there wasn't supposed to be a connection there, but some of the software engineers thought, oh, well, we can get an early head start on it and do some uh, housekeeping. Uh, so unfortunately, that was the demise of the, the uh, Mars polar lander. Um, and believe it or not, Clifford, nothing actually failed there. So everything worked as it was supposed to. Sure. Wow. Um, that's interesting. Thank you. Do you mind diving into uh, another example? I think we have a case study to break down. Right. So this, um, uh, the um, Google case study, that's right. Uh, Google compared um, analyzing 200 incidences uh, versus one of these uh, system theoretic process analyses. Um, and I, they were actually looking at uh, security breaches. So they actually analyzed 200 different security breaches versus one of these statistical theoretical process analysis. And the value of the insights that were generated were about equal. But when they looked at the cost of doing the analysis, the cost of, of 200 incidences um, of, of security problems versus the cost of, of one of these statistical uh, process or system theoretic process analyses, uh, it was a, it turned out it was a fraction of the cost to, to do the, uh, the theoretic analysis. Um, so it's a highly uh, effective way to look at a system. And really what, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're looking at um, expanding the, the um, model of accident causation to include um, unsafe interactions of the system components. And it's a very powerful method to um, combine safety and security. And I, I think this is going to become more and more prevalent. And I, I wanted to point out that uh, there's a link to MIT where work on this is, is being uh, continued. And uh, it's, it's open to the public, so um, our viewers can, can jump on there and take a look. Very cool, thank you. So you sold me on the methodology, you sold me on functional safety as a whole. What sort of hardware uh, do we have available for people to use? Right, so at Microchip, we've been working on functional safety for quite a few years. Um, we're pretty mature in the process. Um, if you look at any product page, um, you'll, you'll see that there's a functional safety ready logo. And that functional safety ready logo means that we have functional safety packages available for those devices. Um, those packages include the FMEDA reports that we talked about earlier that quantify the, the failure rates of the device. Um, we have safety manuals that guide the integrator on avoiding things like um, common cause failure and really tell you how to use the device in a safe way. Um, we also have software libraries for functional safety. So these are the diagnostic libraries that monitor the, the microcontroller itself for these random hardware failures. And, um, you know, if we detect one of those random hardware failures, I'll say it again, that we need to get to a safe state in a short amount of time. Um, so really, any device at Microchip can be used uh, because all of our devices are, are what we call quality managed um, under our quality management system, which is IATF 16949. But, you know, one step further, if you find that functional safety logo on your device, it's going to have that collateral in place and it's going to make uh, your, your, uh, your design effort uh, all that much easier. Thank you very much. And so that's the hardware. What about the software? Right. So we talked about the software libraries, but your development tools, when you're uh, when you have an application that has functional safety requirements, um, all of your tools that you use in the development of that system need to be qualified, either to ISO 26262 or to uh, IEC 61508. Um, 
So we've actually taken that step for you so that MPLAB XC compiler is actually uh, certified by a third party called TUV SUD. And they've looked at how we've developed that compiler and how we test that compiler. And they've said, yeah, Microchip, good job. This, this tool is suitable for use in, in systems that have functional safety requirements. Um, then we heard from clients and they said, well, we need to do these other things that the standard says, like, hey, we need to analyze the code uh, for code coverage and unreachable code and things like that. So we created this MPLAB analysis tool suite. And the tool suite's uh, available, it integrates right into the IDE, and it actually color codes your, your, uh, your source code and tells you um, that it's been, number one, it's been executed, and that number two, maybe it follows a coding standard. Um, we have NISRA um, coding standard built into the tool and some others that um, can ensure that this is good, high quality code. Cool, thank you very much. And Mark, where can people go if they want to learn more? Oh, we've uh, we've been working really hard on a, uh, a design center webpage. Um, so it's a functional safety design center. You can get to it at microchip.com slash functional dash safety. And it has uh, uh, loads of good information about functional safety, uh, the different standards, the different products that we have. Um, and it's more than MCUs. We also have some analog products, some uh, interface products, some FPGAs. Uh, we're adding more and more uh, information onto this product page as, as we uh, move forward. Cool, thank you very much. And uh, we're gonna have links to everything that uh, we just talked about and anything that comes up in the Q&A section in the description in the comments and say it with me. If you can't find it, just email us at livestream at microchip.com and I will make sure that you guys get the information. But that brings us to the end of the presentation portion. I'm gonna throw it over to Nate. And Nate, do we have any questions from the people? All right, so we have one for Xavier. So uh, real fast, when will the WPC mandate uh, move to the QI 1.3, if at all? Yeah, so th there's actually a, a big shift that's upon us um, that it's going to honestly force company to move from the 1.2.4 version of the standards to the 1.3. So there are two important dates that you have to know. It's June 2022 from what we've heard from our experts. Uh, in June 2022, the consortium, the WPC consortium, will stop certifying G1.2.4 and will only certify G1.3 for the consumer market. For the automotive products, um, they're actually giving one more year, and that's June 2023, when, again, uh, you have a grace period up to June, I think it's the 2nd of June 2023, where uh, they will certify to 1.2.4 for automotive product again. Past that, they will certify only Qi 1.3. Cool. What's next? Uh, that's all I have at the moment. So uh, one more thing, since the, this is our last day of design week, I'd like to mention that uh, for those of you out there who, if you want to see anything for uh, future design weeks or anything else that you'd like to see in the future, uh, you can also send that to the exact same email that you can also send your questions to. So uh, live stream at microchip.com. And cool. that's all I have. Thank you very much then. I would like to stress just one last time that uh, you guys can go to microchip.com forward slash design week and it'll take you to this wonderful page. I encourage you all to click on this video. It'll make your day better, I promise. <laughs> you can click register now. It is quick and free and it'll take you to this wonderful on 24 page where you can see all the different talk tracks that we have prepared for you. So while the live portion of this event is ending fairly soon, uh, we have a lot more content for you guys that is live now so you guys can hang out there in the lobby and actually interact with some of our experts. But at this point, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my esteemed panel of guests, and uh, you guys have been wonderful, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, behind the camera. It takes an entire team to do this, and uh, thank you to the viewers, because without you, this would not be happening. And uh, we will see you next year. Stay happy, stay healthy, and uh, I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Okay.